Hey everyone, so I just finished the doorstop of a book, <laughs> this doorstop called The Weirdest People in the World uh, by Joseph Henrik. Um, it came out in 2020, so it's pretty new. And uh, what I wanted to do with this review uh, video is actually break it into two parts. And this first video is just going to be a summary. So I'm just going to attempt to summarize the argument of the book, the main points of this book in a short video. Um, so if you want to get an idea of what the book's about without necessarily my personal reactions to it, maybe this would be help, helpful to you. Um, then I'm going to do another video of, of my actual review, some of my actual thoughts on the argument. So I thought that might be helpful to break those apart so that people could you know, watch whichever one they wanted um, to get an idea of whether or not this is a book that they might want to dive into. Um, so let's get into the summary. It's a huge book. Uh, that's the first thing I want to say about it. It's a, it's a huge argument, huge scope. So I'm going to really try to distill the main ideas, um, as, at least as I receive them, into, into this video. But the first thing to say about it is that that acronym WEIRD, the weirdest people in the world, I had heard that acronym before. And I believe he's actually the one who coined that, um, that term. But what it, how, how it breaks down is it, it, it's an acronym that applies to Western psychology specifically, how Westerners think about the world. And it stands for um, Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich, and Democratic. And they spell the word weird intentionally because part of the, part of the argument of this book is that that is strange. To think about the world that way is strange globally and historically. Most people, most humans who have existed did not, did not approach the world with those lenses um, as weird Westerners. Um, so if that's right, we are, we are an unusual people. Um, and that's really one, one big part of his argument is that um, we are peculiar. Westerners are peculiar and we, need to actually see, we should actually see ourselves that way um, to have a more accurate understanding of the world. But another part of his argument, so he's laying out um, that psychology and kind of describing it and explaining it, but also um, a big part of the book is an historical argument. So he's making a, a, a case for how Westerners became this way. And a lot of books have sought to make this explanation, so, but he is bringing something different. I've read a handful of those um, well-known ones like Jared Diamond and, and, um, and such. But uh, uh, he's trying to bring something different to it, and that is the psychological angle. So how did Westerners' psychology develop in the way it did? What happened historically to, to make Westerners think so differently than the rest of the world? That's the big, big, big idea. And it's a huge argument. I mean, he is making a massive scoped argument. Um, so which is kind of, so I, the, my summary here, I'm going to try to really, really boil it down. But I'm going to step through the four parts of the book really quickly. Um, part one is the zoomed out part where he... Uh, describes cultural evolution and how cultures evolve and societies evolve. Um, he is an evolutionary thinker right up front about that. Um, he teaches, teaches at Harvard, um, teaches this material at Harvard rather, and, uh, and looks at the world through an evolutionary lens. And so know that going into it. But he describes um, how societies, cultures, clans, tribes, people groups, how those kind of their ideas evolve over time how certain ideas survive and get transmitted on to the next generation and how over time a collective wisdom develops he really describes that whole process the role of religion in that process the role of family loyalty the, all that kind of stuff it's really interesting if you're interested in that material it's a really interesting um, argument but it all it lays the groundwork for the rest of the book because the book in a sense is all about cultural evolution how cultures change and evolve um, specifically applied to the West how did the West become what it is so he zooms way out talks about how societies change in the intro to the book talks about what um, a kin-based, kin, K-I-N, kin-based society looks like, how that changes over time. Um, and then he also defines the weird acronym in this first section because he's trying to set it, um, kind of juxtapose it to the rest of the world and how the rest of the world, which has mostly been kin-based, clan-based, family-based uh, societies, how they have functioned and why the West is, looks so different from that. So that's part one. Uh, part two, moving on from the, the zoomed out look at cultural evolution in general, he starts to make an historical argument. And if you're into history, this section of the book is probably going to be the most interesting to you. It's probably one of was my, well, I'll get in my review, but it's probably one of my favorite parts because I love, I love big scope history arguments. Um, but in part two, he introduces uh, kind of the core idea of his book. And one of his core arguments is that actually the Western Christian church is kind of the, well, I think he would say is the reason the West went the way it did. 
Um, and he is not at all a religious, this is not an apologetic for religion or the church or anything like that at all. He's actually quite skeptical um, about the, the claims of the church uh, in terms of divine and transcendence and all that, he, I think he would probably call himself an atheist. Or certainly not, certainly not religious in any sense is what comes out of the book. So, but nevertheless, he's making the case that the church is is really responsible for, specifically the Christian church is responsible for the change and for what would become Western weird society. And he introduces the idea, what well, his idea of the marriage and family plan, which is at the base of this. The MFP is what he calls it. And in a nutshell, the marriage and family plan is a new morality around sex and marriage and family that the Western church introduced to the world and expected its adherents to follow. Things like monogamy, things like um, sexual fidelity within marriage. Um, and uh, th these are really, really significant shifts um, um, just general kind of more stringent morality around sexuality. All these things he argues are really at the core of the change um, because what would happen is as these ideas in a cultural evolutionary sense, as these ideas get traction and took root, they actually started to dismantle the traditional kin-based, clan-based ways of structuring your society. And he goes into much detail about how that played out. Um, and he includes a lot of data, a lot of data. It's not just theoretical stuff. He actually has done a lot of studies. Um, he and his team have done a lot of psychological studies um, in different parts of the world and looked at his historical data to, to back up these claims. There's a really, really interesting section on the, the change of monogamy and how monogamy changes structures of societies, actually. I found that fascinating. So that's part two, more of the historical kind of pro pro progression uh, of these ideas. Part three is then with the marriage and family plan in full full swing, so to speak, what institutions emerged out of that as the kin-based institutions started to be dismantled, um, more impersonal ones emerged, especially things like markets, trade, and laws. Um, how did these institutions emerge out of the new psychology that was formed by the marriage and family plan? Um, he also talks in this section about how this is institutions and psychology feed off of each other. And so his argument is that as psychological, psychologically Westerners changed, um, they were kind of changed by institutions and rules, but as their psychology changed, they also changed institutions, which further changed the psychology. And so there's kind of a loop that happens there. And he shows this in the emergence of, um, of things like markets and trade and impersonal currency um, that emerged and all, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's, that is what comes out in part three. And then finally in part four, as I try to br bring this to a close, part four, he, uh, he just lays out the full emergence of the Western weird world. Um, democracy and representative government eventually come out of this post, especially the Protestant Reformation is a really big push towards all of this, right? Especially individualism. Um, and the role of innovation and competition in Western Europe between what would become different nation states. Um, he really uh, shows the, emerg the full emergence of Western thinking in society in part four and um, references a lot of Jared Diamond's work in ways that he's built, he's trying to build on it and, and insert the psychological component there. And so you have the weird, the weird Western world coming out of centuries and centuries of cultural evolution uh, that was shifted by what he would say is the marriage and family plan of the Western church. Western Christian Church in Western Europe, um, and then you have then you have what we have: uh, educated, rich, individualist, democratic Westerners. Um, so that's his argument in a nutshell. It's a huge scope. It's I barely barely scratch the surface of it here in these few minutes. It's a massive scope. It's a lot of data. It's not just historical data, but data his team has gathered personally through their own um, experiments and psychological studies. Um, of people in lots of different cultures. He compares cultures a lot, compares religious thought systems uh, and their impacts, the, the trajectories and directions of different governments and societies. Um, he talks a lot about how anyone who observed the world in the year 1000 would be shocked to think that Western Europe would emerge in such a dominant way because it was um, riddled with poverty and disease. And, you know, um, so it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating look at a major scope of history um, and a lot of data about psychology and economics and anthropology and all of that stuff. So, so that's, his, that's his essentially his argument in a nutshell, uh, how the West became psychologically peculiar and particularly prosperous. Um, so if, hopefully that summary, if that summary scratched an itch for you, you probably want to dive into this book. It's got a lot more to offer. Um, but I'm going to do another video now um, of my personal reactions to the book and some of my actual thoughts. So watch that if that sounds of interest to you. Thanks for watching.